my original thought with a Christmas ornament uh, demo was that we needed to do it earlier. Uh, I participated in one and we've always, they, they always tend to happen in November and December. And quite often it's too late then by the time you get the inspiration to go out and find the wood and and uh, screw up and make mistakes and, and, and get it right uh, to have the stuff done in time for Christmas. So I thought that it might be a good idea to, to do this earlier in the year to, to buy a little time for ourselves. And uh, that would be the first part. And then the second part, of course, is about Tom. And, and uh, I've seen his ornament dis uh, demos before and they've always been very, very good and, and uh, very interesting. And Tom being one of the, the, the turners in our club who has helped me uh, a lot personally and uh, has always been willing to share information and and I've seen his a lot of his work and and just how good it is so I'm 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 always excited to hear what he's got to say. All right, well thank you for that introduction to Tom. I agree. He's a remarkable turner, has taught me a lot and indeed that's true, Tom. Don't grimace when I say these words. The uh Ornaments from the past have been really cool, and I'm anxious to see what he's done uh, for this demonstration. So without further ado, Tom, go to it. Here we go. <clears throat> well, this ornament, like many I've done, has been stolen, of course, the design from David Reed Smith. And he does on the web, he's got a website, and a pretty good demonstration of this step by step by step, but of course his come out looking better than mine do, but that's the way it is. Um, if Peter was here, I'd make absolutely certain to attribute this to him because I've told him in the past that what you do is file up the serial numbers and claim it as your own. And he said, no, 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 attribute it to where it came from. So courtesy of David Reed Smith. This is, let's see, get it up here where you can see it. Why don't we go to this view right here? Straight down, yeah. This is what we're talking about making. Um, in some ways, it's your classic, you know, bowl or round thing coming down to a finial at the bottom. What is different is that there are going in on the side of this. Um, and for non-turners, that might be sort of hee hee, but for a turner, you realize that's a bit more doing. Um, first one I made was out of walnut and no decoration on it whatsoever, but it's sort of, I thought, um, tried then uh, to try it with some color in there because these openings make it sort of just begging for some sort of decoration. They can also be scaled down in size. I thought those looked a little bit clunky this one got beat up here. You're not supposed to notice that. Ray's got too much of a close-up for me. Um, you can scale it down in size, even more like, even more like this, which is what about four and a half inches long total. So whatever you know looks good to your eye in there, in terms of proportion there and how long the finial would be, in terms of that. Um, one of the things about appearance of these is, you know, if you were to start out with a piece this wide, and David recommends one of one and three quarters inches, which this started out, and you turned the sphere there and looked at it, you would see something only one and three quarter inches wide. But when you're looking at this, you're really looking at sort of like that. And if you look at it from the side, the eye sort of wants to follow that around to create a align with that. And so what you're really looking at is the width of from diagonal to diagonal there. And so it always looks wider than what you started out with. And that's why just, you know, dealer's choice as to how big you make. It takes a jig to make this and you have to make your jig a size that fits here. So you kind of have to decide what you want before you start out doing that. 
I'm going to show making the jig, which soaks up probably half of the demo. Um, and then the turning itself is not real esoteric, although these are a little bit interesting and have potential for more screw ups. If you break this thing down, you really have a sphere, more or less, that you're going to turn here. You've got the inset things you're going to turn there, and you have a finial. And so if you want to practice this before you tie into the real thing, you can do each of those separately, which I tried to do getting ready for this. Fine, they're sort of so-so, pulled very true like a croquet ball. You, you know, spheres of various size to get your technique for that. Finials, of course, everybody here is an old pro at finials, right? But it doesn't hurt to practice them a little bit. Um, one, this is a fairly, you know, this is what David had, and you can obviously do any kind of fancy finial, finial you want to, but this one's sort of a plain vein. The biggest trick to it, I think, is trying to get sort of a swoop through there, to where it's not just a flat line, you know. When Tom showed his table leg, he was trying very hard to cut an absolute straight flat line down the table leg. And here, you don't want just a triangle, you want a little bit of going down on there. So that's tricky a little bit. Um, the other is the cutting in on the face, which is a very different thing because you're basically, the way things are spinning for this, it is cross grain there. And then coming in to cut these has a lot of potential for run back. So, I just cut a piece of, you know, knocked off the pieces out in the corner there, so I could then put this into my chuck across there, off to one side or off to the other side, and could practice doing these before I got to the real McCoy. Um, so let's let's start out with making the jig for this. This is sort of what we're going to wind up with. This, yeah, um, made like this. It's got a piece of plywood in the back. It's got a little piece here added onto it, so you can your chuck. It has a stop block here, two side pieces, and made to fit the blank that you're going to make this out of. This is so it holds the blank in there. You can do the center parts like this. You get four of those done, and then you put it back in, uh, just like you would for any spindle turning. You get the light just right. Maybe I shouldn't get it right. I just get it. Yeah, there you go. You can see the scene of the crime here where I had a really gorgeous run out. And this is fairly soft wood. This is just for the two by six. And so it just one of the things that we have. So, you have to use a little imagination for this one. Here, okay? This, here we go. Yeah. Pretend this is a piece of plywood. Roughly eight by eight, three quarter inch plywood. I'm going to put an 8 inch circle on it. And I'm also going to put a 3.5 inch circle on it, which is where this piece will go.
the wind up with your piece of plywood again with a couple of circles on it here. So it's off to the bandsaw to cut out roughly as close as you can along there. And when you do, you get something that looks like this. Now ignore the holes for now. Uh, I pre-drilled them for the demo. I would not have drilled them normally by this point. The roughly area eight inches, that's where we're going to put our center piece on there. So to start out, we've got to do the center piece first. Um, a piece of wood, in this case, I selected some maple for it. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, there we go with the light. Outside circle is at three and a half inches, so we're going to true that up. Inside circle is the size that puts fits the jaws of my chuck nicely. So depending on what your chuck size is, you can go there. So you're saying, finally, finally, he's gonna turn some instead of talk. Okay. Oh. So this is just wedged up against the chuck with the tailstock, so it didn't zip too fast. You've got, how does it sound when it got the, sound like I'm in a well? Probably. Um, it's cross grain here, so probably the tool of choice is a bowl gouge. Now we're going to take the stuff down here to create the tenon out there. And since my chuck is a Nova, it has dovetail jaws there. And so I need to put a dovetail on here for it. Dennis Biggs has a wonderful little tool he made. He's the Nova chuck, I know. And he's got a beautiful little tool he made to get this just right. I'm still using just a skew for it. Rev up you just heard was me trying to get used to raised lathe. So I'm gonna put this on here, glue it on, it's very close to the center, that's why that circle is. And then put some screws in it here also to try and anchor it as thoroughly as possible here. So if we weren't in a hurry or doing a demo, I'd probably use some tight bond. But since we'd like to get the show on the road, I brought along some, some super glue 
So I'm going to step off to the back table and do that. I'm using pocket hole screws for this whole thing uh, because they're to a large extent self-tapping and I don't want to necessarily have to drill all the holes and line everything up and so forth. Square guy. Yeah. Okay, here. I mean, I brought a drill and it's faster, but sometimes too fast. No, he didn't make the tenon too deep. That's a good one. Yes, the angle meets the jaws pretty well. This is going to be in and out of the chuck quite a bit. And so I suggest that you mark one of the jaws to try and make that more accurate. And I just pick number one and mark along each side. chance of, of getting it back in there because this project takes a degree of precision beyond which we usually encounter wood turning. Um, so because of that you've got to really you know pay attention to your P's and Q's.
So at this point, we're going to get this into a circle. The other thing which is really important at this point in life is to mark the center of it. That's, you know, if you don't, you just have to, that's all. You got to mark the center because that's going to be key to all the rest of the layout. Part of y'all are looking at me do this and saying, what in the world is in this it backwards? Uh, those of us who use Novas know exactly. They're, they come out of New Zealand. So, you know, they drive on the left there. You turn it left to tighten it. That's the way it is. Next step is to lay out on here where these are going to go. Also, let's backtrack a little bit because we've got to make these things before we can put them on. So another eight inch circle. And this one's on a piece of paper. So the paper in this case is really paper. Once you've created your circle, you want to put a center line on it and any place you want to do it as long as it goes through the center is a center line. So with that dot, we're going to create a center line here. What we're going to do is cut out something along here that's going to be the width of the piece that we put in. And I've made these to be one and three eighths. So, which is what? Six sixteenths, 22 sixteenths. We've got to go 11 sixteenths up and down from each side. So we want a perpendicular on here. I use a protractor, but anything you want to get a nice perpendicular line on this. One on each side. And then you're going to want to mark that 11 sixteenths. draw lines connecting those two. So 
what you're gonna do. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got our circle. Going to cut out this much out of the middle of it. It's going to leave us with two of these more or less hemispheres on there. So, you cut it out, you cut off the two, cut off the two lines we made, so you got it like this. This is where you have to use imagination again. This this is a piece of wood. It is one and three eighths inch thick. Um, the one we're going to use today is some plywood that I cut down to size. The one that I showed you before with the two by four, I ran through the planer to get it down to one and three eighths. So, with your imagination, this is one and three eighths inch thick. You glue these on there. Spray on glue, probably. Like this and so. Yeah, that would make your job easier, I'm sure. Thank you. Okay. You're going to go glue them on there. A key point here is you've got to have a straight edge. Okay. However you want to get that by sawing it, by jointing it, whatever your pleasure is. Uh, you know, you can scrunch them up around however you want to to get them on there. And then cut these out with a bandsaw. It is not crucial you be exactly on the line it just aesthetically it's nice to do so okay so you do that and you wind up with something like this it's these two pieces they've got that one and three eighths missing in them great good seven good 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 chisel i forgot to talk So, back to this piece. Again, any line that goes through the middle. I've got to work on it, so I'm just propping it up so this only thing goes down there. Any line that goes through the middle would be a midline. Again, you kind of ignore the holes here because they've been pre-drilled. But we're going to want those in the middle, so I'm going to go across there. This is where you want to be just as accurate as you can, and right? perhaps just a wee bit. If Ray were to zoom, he could show you that I didn't quite hit the middle. But go with that. We need to do more or less the same thing on this to create the open space where these are going to go. And to mark those points, I've taken to trying to use a pair of dividers rather than just a pencil here. Um, let 
little bitty dots that I can see, you probably can't. At the very least, doing it this way assures that your lines are going to be the same distance from the center line. It doesn't guarantee you're going to have exactly one and three eighths inch, but you do have symmetry there. So if you get down to the end and it's too sloppy big, you can shim it on both sides and get things back to the middle. So a line here. And I'm going to use a knife because I want this to be just as skinny and accurate as I can. You guys that are used to doing metal working, uh, this is still pretty crude, but for those of us that just work in wood, this is probably about as accurate as you ever have to get. And one more thing, we want to get a line out here, two inches, two inches in from this point. This one is not quite so much, quite so much a hanging matter if it's not dead on. This is where our stop block is going to go. So, what we're going to do at this juncture is to, this has a bunch of holes because I used it before when I was doing it with the one and three quarter. We want to put each of these just as close along that line that I cut or mark as we possibly can. So we're gonna put three screws in it from this side to hold it. I'm gonna get those rascals started. The screws before that I used were one and a quarter and these are one and a half. And I guess I'm a Ludite that I'm using a screwdriver instead of a drill. Again, the square drive pocket hole screws. The jig takes a fair while to make, obviously. But if you're gonna make several of these, it once you get the jig made, the actual making of the ornament doesn't really take all that long. And so, you know, if this is one you're gonna to give to multiple grandchildren or something like that, it's a pretty good one because once you go through all this nonsense, things move things move along pretty quickly.
<laughs> the stock for this has to be also cut fairly precisely. It's got to be just exactly square. Dimensions have to be the same. Um, it's going to sit in here more or less like this. Um, I've made these a little longer than I need to because I want to have some extra stuff when I put it on to do spindle turning. It means this sticks out a little bit, but I didn't want to make the whole shoot match that much bigger. So you're kind of aware of that and don't get whacked by it. In this case, this is going to go right there against that. Um, which ball has been done well. The ball is right on that line. Looks like it does. back to turn it, I promise you. Yeah, if anybody's got questions while I'm puttering with this, fire away. Tom, why are you using just a regular screwdriver instead of a power driver? Oh, I guess I'm old fashioned and I don't want to, it's just a hassle for no more than these are. Oh, okay. So I, instead of matching the line this time, I'm just going to use, instead of matching the line, I'm going to use this as my filler because that's what I want to go in there. It looked like when I put it on there, it hit the line exactly. If you don't get this exactly centered, the little thing you put, the piece that you're going to put on the side will not be centered. Yeah, we use a screwdriver so I can fill time here, you know. I don't tap dance very well, so we have to kill it however we can. Don't worry, I like using a screwdriver too. Mm-hmm. Okay, two more little. There we are, hiding behind that. The stop block. Um, want that to have two inches between the center, I will, two inches between the center and where that line is. And there are a couple of holes pre-drilled as I was getting ready for this.
this ornament can actually be made with something different besides this jig. You can put wooden jaws on your chuck, but it takes a bigger chuck, takes, you know, a large, larger than your standard here. And because I didn't think it likely everybody had a three and a half or four inch chuck, went with this way. But like I told Steve, if he's trying to put together a program and is desperate and wants to put together something that has a number of 20 or 30 minute presentations, I'll go through the wooden chuck, wooden jaws at that point. They, it's, it's faster. Because at this point, what, what we have to do is put our blank in there and hold it with screws. And then every time you turn it to the other side, you have to take the screws out it again. So that's what da, 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 da. these, this hole and this hole are for, no, this hole and this hole are for anchoring, anchoring the blank. That's just the center point. These two are going to use screws to anchor the blank. This one goes right through this thing so I've got to drill it the rest of the way through. Where do you have an eight inch here? I mean, close to it, whatever. You know, you put all this crap together before you try and come and you invariably forget something. Came out there. To use the same screws both places, I need to more or less countersink this, create another hole big enough for the head of the screw. So with all this done, let's put a block in. This is poplar. Um, obviously it wouldn't be the thing you'd use if you were gonna give this away, but it's cheap to practice with and I bet it bought a big slug of it using it for practicing making spheres and stuff like this. So, Got to do it this way to make sure it's up again the stop block.
initially had thought I would just, you know, talk about this and then show the one I'd already made, but thought that if anybody really wants to take on this project, it would be a lot better if you actually saw the process of creating this creature. And like Ray said, how else am I going to fill the time? So this screw is a half inch from the stop block. This one is about three quarters of an inch there. They're both going into wood that's going to be turned away. That's, that's the theory here. I was going to put this up there and not lose it. First step is to mark the center of this rascal. for my all. Screwdriver there. And I know I brought the bloody thing. going to draw a circle for this. With this being one and three eighths, we want our circle to be one and an eighth. And this one's important enough to be accurate. I usually go down and put a circle on a piece of paper to make sure I'm pretty close to what it should be. A little off center. Well, for the demo, that's what we're going to have to do. But that would be aggravating if it were, and might have to go back and reposition if, uh, if this was really for the money. Need to put in a depth hole. This is seven sixteenths to a half, something like that. The old classic marker on here.
it'll mean that the these won't be quite the same same thickness won't be quite symmetric You want to be sure when you're doing this that you're creating a cone. You don't want to create a bowl shape there. There is not a great deal of wood in here. Okay, um, Maybe an eighth of an inch, maybe a little less. You can see how skinny it is when it starts out. If you try and if you swoop it around and try and create a bowl shape, this is what you get. This is, this is one of the learning curve kind of things, you know. It looks fine here, but I gypped, tried to make too much of a bowl there, and so I went through the wall. And so. I usually use, or I have used a spindle gouge for this to try and do this. Uh, you can certainly do it with carbide. Works very nicely. I tried that at home a little bit. Um, carbide has the advantage of when you put a gouge into this without anything for the bevel to ride on, it really wants to fade away. And so that is one of the technical parts of this, which is difficult to go straight into something like this without having it skid on you. Let's see if I can do that. I do it by laying the bevel directly against the wood. And it starts to cut just a little bit. And you get support. You've got to go a little faster, though, because you're right at the middle. I can still see a hole in there, so. Mm -hmm. If we were making this for real, this would be the time to sand, because you're never going to be back here again. So basically the same thing now, three more times. Tom, did you say you used a spindle gouge to gouge I that out? A, I used a spindle gouge on that. Okay, thank you. Three eight spindle. You could always also use a scraper of any kind you wanted. Uh, probably give a little rougher finish. What you're seeing there is that I probably didn't have my stock just exactly square. spite of running it through the table saw and then giving it a quarter turn and running it through again, I suppose I've exerted a little less pressure on the fence or something. So it's just, just a skoshy different.
if you were to use softer wood for this piece in the back besides maple, which I've done on this one, uh, it's probably a good idea to dribble some thin CA glue around it to harden it up because over time you'll squish it and it'll start to deform a little bit. That's the voice of experience by the by. song and dance. Find the center. harder wood I'd probably actually have to use power for this but it's on this darn poplar it's so easy to overshoot it if you're going in a half an inch on each side you've only got about an eighth of an inch in the middle and so if you overshoot it's another one of those OG moments now what do I do yeah yeah you Put a little little stone on each side of it to hold the defect. Any questions while we're going through this repetition stuff? Tom, the engineer in me wants to use a template to measure that cove shape. Do you just eyeball it? Uh, obviously, the one of your practice pieces, you didn't eyeball it quite right. Or, right. Uh, um, the point, you want to go just as straight as you can towards the center is all i mean you want to create okay. a cone and not a not a, not a bowl shape right okay but yeah i mean this is this is the thing where an engineer would look at it and go, yeah, so he'd, also have a, he'd also have an impact driver i didn't know they made those things that you twist with your wrists okay now, You'd be amazed as you're doing this, one of the screw ups is to put it back in like this. <laughs> don't don't can, say it couldn't happen to you as you're flipping uh, around can, this and that and trying to make sure. Uh, I can see that happening.
Dennis, are you going to be at the Smoky Hill River Festival? Uh, you know, I haven't planned that far ahead. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, when is it? Okay. When is the Smoky Hill River Festival? End of September. I thought you might be demoing there or selling there. No, I've started selling at 24 seven uh, truck stops and that's turned out to be a job, keeping them ah. stuck. <laughs> yeah, the River Festival starts on September 3rd. It's over Labor Day weekend. It's Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Okay, thanks. I'm new to Kansas, so I don't know where the River Festival is. Where is it gonna be? Smoky Hill River Festival is in downtown Salina. And it's in the Oakdale Park, right in the middle of the city. And it's a three-day thing with uh, music. And um, I think they have about 160 artists exhibiting their work. Um, lots of music, lots of uh, greasy food. I shouldn't say that. A lot of good stuff to eat. Um, my wife is a fiber artist, and she has a demonstration booth that she'll be uh, uh, exhibiting at. I'll have to check that out, thanks. Yeah, you'd enjoy it. David, I'm assuming it's still on. It's still on. The director sent out a, a new uh, proclamation yesterday. They are uh, requesting everyone wear masks and um, uh, there will be, uh, well, the Kansas Health and the Kansas Department of Health and Environment uh, uh, issued an order last week saying that any gathering of over 500 people, uh, those that are not vaccinated would have to self-quarantine after going to that event. Mm -hmm. And uh, vaccinated people are not subject to the quarantine, but still there obviously is a risk even for those folks with uh, breakthrough infections. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's going to be masked. Everybody's going to be social distancing. They've, they've added additional uh, uh, information and taken out things like uh, bleachers where people tended to uh, sit close together, that's all going to be a, a different uh, scenario than it used to be. And um, for us, it's still a couple weeks away and there's still a chance that it could be canceled entirely, but at this point it's still on. Okay, thank you. David, are there usually turning sold there or turners in present? Um, in the, well, the, they did not uh, have the festival last year because of COVID, but uh, two years ago there were, uh, oh, let me see, there were three professional turners and uh, uh, the, uh, actually four, four uh, professional turners. Gary Hobby of our club was there as one of the demonstrators and he and uh, um, Forgive me, Gary, if you're out there, I've forgotten your, your partner's name. But he and a, a partner from Oklahoma were there demonstrating. And um, uh, they had three artists in the, well, two artists in the fine arts area and one in the uh, crafts area that were uh, selling their things. So there's some interesting, and there's some other flat work people there that are showing things too that uh, would be of interest to folks.
it's a nuisance if you forget the order of things and drill the hole before you make the circle because it's hard to get the compass to sit in there well. It's one of those, you don't need to ask me how I know that. How do you know that? <laughs> they say that experience is a great teacher, don't they? But the, the lesson, the tuition tends to be high. That's why you turn your first one out of poplar. Yeah, that's right. So we've done all those, we've sanded all those, which we're not doing both for the sake of time and also to minimize dust and raise shop because if we turned on the dust collector, you wouldn't hear anything, I'm sure. Not a bit. I mean, he cleaned this shop up so much for this. Tom, once you have all four of those cones turned in that ornament, how much wood is in the center? Uh, eighth of an inch or so between one side and the other. Thank you. Okay. It's on to spindle work. So we'll mark the ends of this rascal. Um, I'm going to use this drive because it is the smallest diameter one that I have. And I put it in with the part where the finial is going to be going down this way because it is a lot easier for a right-hander to, to sweep something nicely. You know, you've got to go downhill with that, so that works very well. Don Baker might well want to flip this the reverse so he could swing down towards the tailstock to create his finial. Any of the other folks that are left-handed, I just happen to know that Don is. The first chore is gonna to be to round this up, but not so much right here, 
and then get a lot of the wood off of here. So to sort of keep me out of harm's way as much as I can, I'm gonna put some marks here on what I want to, where I want to concentrate initially. Tom, the audio cut out a little bit as you was as you were describing the drive center. Were you using mm -hmm. a step center or what? What were you using? It's a it is a four prong center, <coughs> and I use it. Oh, okay. It's primarily a, because it's, it's the a spur diameter I have. My step. I use okay, my step. Okay, got it. <clears throat> if I had a step that size, I'd use it. Um, okay. Good. Thank you. Fortunately, Ray. Um, it may be back. Okay. Show, Ray, Ray, it shows your video is there. Are you still there? There we go. Just getting the sound, no picture. Anyone getting a photo or a picture? No, the video from right there it is. It's back again. It Got it. So that was basically just getting wood out of the way. Um. For this part, if you're really good with the skew, this is a damn fine place for it. Uh, myself, I'm going to use a 3 8 inch spindle gouge, but uh, you're going to be turning a lot of air as you go through, or you've just got these little things to go. So at this point, you really want to jack up the speed a lot. The faster it is, the better chance you're going to have of seeing where you're really cutting. And we're going to try and create, you know, a sphere more or less that diameter. We shall see.
Um, you can see on here we've still got sort of a flat. We're trying to get where you've just got a sharp edge all the way around here. So we're going to have a bridge across there, but we don't want the flat on this side. So I need particularly take a little more. As fast as I had that going, I really could tell the ghost image pretty well. I don't know if you can see that on the, on the camera. And that was about 2,400. So you can see I've got a little bump there in the middle yet. This is pretty much, you know, except for that nice circle there, fairly, in spite of the way I was a little bit off, these aren't badly asymmetric. This, this is a case of that classic one more cut to smooth this. Obviously, it was too much. This this is the time to sand this now. By the time you get these things done, it's going to be real skinny out here, and it's going to be hard. So you would sand at this point. You might take these down a little more so you can get to it to sand it. I suppose I'm going to take just a wee bit off there to try and get rid of that flat.
this is probably going to be a little long for this video for all all considered probably stop it about there which means i could have had the blank shorter and it would have been sticking out of the jig as much these are still screw holes and i'm hoping to hell that as i take this down those are going to go away either that or it's going to go for shorter screws next time I'm going to put a little oh, bead down here at the bottom of this to sort of sort of fade out to infinity to sort of give it a, a termination point. That's what I've marked out there. Um, <clears throat> where I really get super skinny here, I think I'll go back and work on this part a little bit, though. Can you see things? Races, we're having some technical oh, no. difficulties. Yeah, Ray, we've lost big video and audio from you. I've got audio, but no video. There it's come back. Are we good now? What do you say? Yeah, you're, you're back on. Okay.
Can I stand just a little bit? You got a piece of 120 or 240? I didn't bring it. <laughs> I just... I find sanding to help get that, you know, it's not done in the best of circles and that sort of stuff, but I find it really hard to get that beautifully smooth and also that little bit of concavity without it. And also it'll help that little corner just a wee bit. So in spite of what I said about sanding it for you out there, we're gonna do just a little bit. Not enough to make a finished product, but just for shaping. You can tell things are wiggling there. I don't know what you all think, but I think that improved it. But we're also, it's essentially broken right there. That's why it was wobbling. So we'll go ahead and take this off. So. You take your handy dandy little saw, you divide it right there. You can then put your holder tip down there and that's it. You probably, we ought to consult David to do the decoration on it because he does some of those fantastic decorative stuff I know of so we'll let him be the consultant for that yeah wow you haven't looked at my rate of uh, charges have you but uh, <laughs> I'm flattered by that oh that was excellent excellent Tom um, that um, jig you showed us by the way decorated hanging on the tree yeah Excellent. Well done. The jig you showed us is very similar to ones that are used to turn uh, measuring scoops and spoons. Oh, and so yeah. if you're into yeah. making ornaments, you might also think about that. Make that jig universal so you can do other projects with it, too. Right. You just, you know, turning into the faces that you can create your spoon or whatever. Yeah, I can see right. that. Right. Right. Tom, uh, what do you use then for your coloring? Well, what I've done on, yeah. I'm not terribly pleased with the coloring I've done. I've, I've got some wax that I use and you know, this almost looks like a railroad signal with the green and red, it's bright. This I put on some uh, gold wax can't see it very well it's silver um, for colors in there thinking it'd be kind of Christmassy um, I've also thought you could do it with a wood like uh, Coco Bolo that would just you know shine up real well on its own and be pretty um, you could I also thought about using some of that uh, oh stuff David showed us on some of his it looks like it's old copper or oxidized copper or something in there um, you could obviously you know spray paint the whole rascal some color if you wanted to and then do contrasting stuff in these but i think to put some sort of color in these accentuates them and that's really what what differentiates this from just your standard globe and finial on top so i think you'd probably want to accentuate this some but I'm, I'm not real pleased with what I've done on decorating, but certainly 
that is not my long suit at all. What else can I tell you? Or claim ignorance of? Thank, thank you, David. All right, thank you, Tom. Any other questions for Tom? Tom, you probably explained this at the beginning, but what was your blank size to start out with? Uh, these, I mean, the one that David said is one and three quarters. But as I said, it, it makes for what looks to me kind of clunky in terms of size. It really take a, you see, this is what he, size he said, and I put a longer finial on this one. Yeah. Uh, which I think balanced it out better. The one I used here that I did today was one and three eighths. So I did one and three eighths. The circle on it was one and one eighth, uh, trying to leave an eighth on each side there. And, and what the, was the length? Uh, you know, I didn't have a distinct length. I made the blank. Oh, six and a half inches or something, but as you saw, a, a lot of it is when you get down working on your finial, what looks about right to you in length. I mean, you've got this, yeah, and yeah. so it's, I, I make it a little long so that I've got some room to fudge and don't have to get too close to the drive center. But it's one and three eighths by, okay. I think, six and a half or seven, which is overkill. But, the downside of making it long is it's sticking out of that jig and flying around, so you really want to stay on your side of the tool rest. Uh, if yeah. you don't, it'll tell yeah. you about it. Thank you. Okay. Okay, any other questions? I would recommend, though, if you're going to take in, tie into this, make for those in-face parts, practice it first. I mean, the time you've got your blank on there and, and you know, you've done all that to get it right and about the third or fourth one, it rips out on you with a big run out. It'll, it'll stress your vocabulary. 